Hello, dear viewers. Or should I say, raise your cups and hail a toast, dear listeners. For tonight, on the 40th episode of Roll of a Tangent, we finally return to Robert E. Howard and the entertaining prose he crafted for the world to enjoy. My name is Nikita Zuev, and I come once again, and I am joined by Robert Gibson and XJ. Rogues in the House is another typical adventure depicted um, within the story of the Hyborian Age, um, particularly starring Conan the Barbarian, as per usual for our podcast. The story starts with uh, Conan already in captivity, betrayed and chained to another savage um, uh, due to another savage tussle in a nail biting tale that is the life of our Sumerian. Once again, Robert's manner uh, of creating a convoluted yet entertaining web uh, of allegiances shines through as we learn of the harsh politics in a nameless town between Zamora and Corinthia. This time, aristocracy and the clergy uh, are sorting out their differences, represented by Murillo the Noble and Nabonidas, the Red Priest, respectively. Conan conspires with several characters within the tale, but this may be the longest time we spend with the Sumerian as a protagonist um, since the Tower of the Elephant. Of course, most of Robert E. Howard's stories span a multitude of, of perspectives, and this time it's no different, so being within the mind of our favorite barbar is a welcoming sight. The bulk of the story consists of the hunt for Namonitis, Na- Nabonidus, I think it's said, my apologies, <laughs> uh, the red priest who seems to be a step ahead of all others involved. Right until he, uh, he turns out to be a prisoner of his own making, an ape-humanoid hybrid named Thak turns out to be the main antagonist of the tale. I think, Robert, you've got a, um, a picture for us, don't you? Of Thak on your, on your book. There we go. That's Frank Frazetta doing a fantastic job right there. If you're only listening to this, you're missing out. Go search Frank Frazetta. He's, he's amazing. <clears throat> so, and we see Conan once again battling insurmountable odds of a well-bred being filled with malice and lacking any empathy for the lives of men. The story concludes as Thak is defeated and Conan, in a swaggering manner, kills the bitter betrayer Nabonidus, the Red Priest. Uh, and how does he kill him, you may ask? Is there a fantastical duel? Does Nabonidus shoot lightning out of his fingertips? No. Conan throws a stool <laughs> at, at the priest and the priest dies. Um, which is probably the most hilarious ending that uh, Robert E. Howard has ever created, at least uh, to my knowledge. Um, yeah, so that is Rogues in the House. Um, let's see what the other, um, w- w- what my other co-hosts thought of the tale. Robert, why don't you start? How do you feel about Rogues in the House? It's like all Conan stories, well worth reading. I mm. would not place it v- near the top of the Conan stories, but it's got some charming aspects to it. Like, for example what to do with a uh, a girl who has betrayed you. Um, the answer is you lift her up and, and drop her into a cesspool. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's Conan's method, and it's quite uh, good for the suspense in the story because you wonder what, what awful thing is this savage barbarian going to do to this girl who betrayed him to the authorities? And... The answer is uh, he, he's not going to wound her at all, except in her pride. So yeah, it's, it's quite good. Also, another you... nice touch is oh, yeah. uh, when um, somebody comes to Conan in his cell, and it says that Conan looked with interest because he thought that the fellow was come to execute him. That's a, a good little sidelight on Conan's character. He regards death imminent death as something interesting not to not to tremble about 
Yeah, indeed. He multiple times in the story he showcases um, disregard for death. Though at the end, he does say that he does not want to meet it just yet, right? And he wants to move on. I think uh, out of all the tales that we have had uh, about Conan in uh, uh, in <clears throat> what's it called um, on our podcast, uh, this is the most casual of all the tales. Um, would you agree, Robert? Would you say that, you know, like, it's I it's much more laid back? Adjective, but, yes, I think you've picked a good adjective there. It is a, a casual story. Um, mm, very laid back. Yeah. And, um, actually, this is one of the reasons why I suggested it, because it's so unorthodox for most other stories uh, written about Conan and the Hyborian Age. This feels like... Um, you know, um, somebody uh, on a on a TV show has decided that we're going to write an episode which will have a different atmosphere from what we usually do, right? And I think this this um, uh, tale really succeeds at it. I'll I'll refrain to say what I think about it um, in in earnest um, in a, in a moment. But um, XJ. What about you? How did you feel about the story of Rogues in the House? First of all, mm -hmm. this is very important. Oh, shit. Yeah, the story <laughs> did not start in the tavern. <laughs> <laughs> you got me off guard with that one. Yeah, the story indeed does not start in the tavern. What an astute uh, observation. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You got me there. Uh, aside from that, I I agree with uh, Rob. It's got some very light moments, and uh, it's very easy reading. Uh, best done with, uh, with a cup of coffee on a cold day with a plate of nuts and cheese, which is exactly mm -hmm. what I did uh, when reading this story. I think there was one... It feels almost like the uh, you could uh, this so this story is visual in a way that the previous Conan stories we have read is not. I rem I think there is one scene where he was describing it, uh, where Robert E. Howard was writing it, and I could actually see the uh, comic panels. You know, uh, I. Think there was a scene where he was describing how he got caught in the first place, right? He ran his head into the wall or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> that that scene I could totally see it in comic panels, man. I I I I was like, it really feels like this. Uh, this uh, story was written uh, in a way. I don't know if he wrote it for that purpose, or he wrote it in a way that makes it. It just uh, just kind of stumbled into writing it in a way that made it easy to make a comic out of it. But yeah, um, I think I think I thoroughly uh, agree with uh, Robert. Actually, it's a very easy read. Uh, definitely a very casual, like you said, Nikki, way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Uh, reading I wouldn't put it top of the pile but still entertaining nonetheless the only thing mm. I don't quite like about the story is why is but it has nothing to do with this particular story itself but more with a with uh, something about uh, fantasy in that in that era and and that is why does every weird, bad, savage thing come out from the East? I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> the East is more civilized sure. than the West back in the day. <laughs> really sorry, but, you know, make it in the West next time. <laughs> I think oh, they... they, the, they River, yeah, go ahead. The West uh, the savages are all in the West and beyond the Black River. Okay, mm. cool. <laughs> I got a, um, you know, I never thought of it from that perspective that uh, XJ has just mentioned. But from the other hand, uh, you know, um, 
every every James Bond movie has uh, Russians as the bad guys. And whether or not we're good, uh, you know, good at it, we're, we're pretty good at being the bad guys. Um, you know, it's still it's still kind of sucks, right? When you're constantly it, absolutely. Yeah. I, I get what you mean. Uh, I didn't think of it that way. So did that uh, does that distract um, a lot of enjoyment from from works that you read? It's like oh here here we go the savage creature from the from the east. I mean the the Fu Manchu thing gets tiring after a while. I gotta admit. Mm -hmm. And also <laughs> there was not a lot of that in this story, was there? Or am I wrong? In this in this no, like I said, it's not particular to this uh, story but mm. uh, you remember the other one we read where i can't remember the name but uh, he went and uh, it was it was after he became king and then he lost his kingdom and then he had to go get a yes, yes, the hour of the dragon yes yeah yeah the hour of the dragon and that was that was like you got a bunch of assassins and that is full on Fu Manchu mm. thing, right? It's, oh, uh, it's just, it does get uh, a bit um, boring after a while because every portrayal from the East is like that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, man, that sucks. Yeah. I didn't think of it that way. I mean, in uh, in Hollywood movies, the villains uh, mostly have British accents. I've noticed, so uh, it's not just the East, you know. That's is that true? There is a well, lot of British villains because yeah. you know you sound proper, therefore you uh, <laughs> you know you're you're more intimidating. That is that is the definitely the case. So we are the trifecta of villains: here. <laughs> the savage East, the what's it called the ruthless Russian. And the sophisticated uh, Brit. So, you know, we are we are the villain gallery here, yeah, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, I suppose maybe we should change the name of the podcast, the villain. The gallery. villain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, roll off vill villainry. <clears throat> All right, let's get back to the story. Um, what story? So, <laughs> so rogues in the house uh, has a really fun um, uh, section. For, a couple of really fun sections for me. Um, and no, it's not the one where the, the lady gets thrown into shit. Um, though it it is quite remarkable to me. Let's discuss this point first. It's really remarkable to me that Conan kills some innocent dude <laughs> who was just in the vicinity, but mm. uh, but he doesn't do anything to the girl. Yeah, right? I that. yeah, that's odd. And uh, it's quite odd to me. I don't really know what to make of it. No, I don't either. No, I, I don't understand why he. Um, if if uh, the viewers want to be uh, want me to be a bit more specific about what exactly I'm talking about, uh, when he goes to find the butterfly of the night, the prostitute that betrayed him, at the end of the uh, story, uh, at the beginning of the story. My apologies. Um, Conan finds her and she is servicing a client at the time. And after he, you know, she does uh, business with him or during the time that they were doing their business, um, Conan shows up and kills the, the, the customer um, and then, for, you know, and then punishes the girl by throwing her into the cesspool that uh, was previously mentioned. By uh, by Robert. So the the qu the question really stands to me like, why does he kill that guy? What what was the purpose of that? If you know, like he's just some dude. You could have just knocked him out. Yeah, he was b being a bit brazen, I guess. But like, mm. does that just satisfy? Yeah, I don't get it. It's a bit of a blip in the career of Conan. I think we'll have to just pass it over in embarrassed silence. I think that would be the best uh, best way. Um. I'd like to make another point about the story, which I, I forgot to say, I forgot to mention when you asked me about it first, and that is it's rather unbalanced structurally. It's in three parts, and the third part is as long as the first two put together. There's a five-page five page part one, three-page part two, and then a 16-page part three. 
and mm. part three is the bit underground and i think there's too much of this underground bit that's what i felt when i was reading it anyway that i thought that bit dragged a bit now we must we must keep it in proportion here when a a, a howard story drags it, it's still 10 times more interesting than most other people's stories but still relative to his other kind of stories i think this one's a bit unbalanced uh, a bit too much of the struggling around in in this underground tunnel oh okay i think i think uh this could be really easily solved by howard himself by splitting it in two sections and actually having there some sort of a situation going on with the red priest like an actual battle or maybe a confrontation you could still have the um very you know humorous ending with you know, Conan finding a stool and <laughs> hitting him <laughs> with it, right? But but at least giving some s sort of like, um, you know, expansion to that bit and then making four parts out of this, I think, would, uh, would remedy this issue. Or what do you think? How would you solve it, Robert? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree, absolutely. Um, hmm. yeah. What about you, actually? What do you think about this strange thing that... Uh, you know, um, that Conan does, ki killing that dude. Do you have a, an idea as, as to why he did it? Or are you as baffled as we are? Um, Conan is a bar bar. Yeah, but I mean, he, uh, for sure. I, yeah. I, I, I don't channel Conan the way you do, uh, Nikki. To mm -hmm. me, it just, it actually was like, I did not notice that until, uh, uh, I did not notice the discrepancy until Robert pointed it out. Uh, you did. I pointed it out. You did. You yeah, did. Yeah. yeah sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's all good. Yeah. It, it, I think my attention was more focused on whether he would, he would murder the uh, butterfly of the night, as you put it myself. Mm. And I think that would have, that would have sunk his... Uh, I'm searching for the right word. I can't say character, mm. state status. Although status mm. is not quite the right way to to express what I'm... His moral compass would be altered? Yeah, his moral compass would have sunk mm. a little bit. That doesn't mean he's uh, he would be... I imagine back in the day, uh, fans would have thought a lot lower of him if he had murdered the uh the butterfly of the night uh, yeah, a lot for less sure. and a lot less so for the 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 guy uh the client i imagine yeah for sure it is it is quite discouraging though that um you know i really i really wish i could ask uh robert e howard be like mm. come on man what's go what was going on here what are you tr what are you trying to do we could mm. we could set up an uja board yeah no problem Summon his spirit mm. from beyond. Mm. <laughs> Not sure about that. <laughs> um, how the Conan does show a lot of uh, principle in the story, though. When he he could have got out of the city, and but he he decides that he owes yep. a favor to the person who who made his escape from prison possible. That is that is yeah. true. So you may be right in uh, pointing out the discrepancy, uh, Nikki. Mm. Uh, it's mm. like he he is, he had a he has a sort of honor the whole way through, and then that's just this blip. Mm. Which, yeah, just uh, it's just really strange. Which you like can Robert said, a sense of honor with with uh, holding human life very cheap though. Uh, that's true. You know, and and that's the story kind of emphasizes that actually. That's true. I mean, these, look at these Orientals. Look at these these fanatical Orientals. Uh, you know, the cold of Bushido and all that. You know, I mean, it, it really is. I okay, mean, that's uh, that's a solely Japanese thing. Nothing to do with the Chinese. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, one thing I Robert do... tried his best to generalize, but it just didn't happen. Yeah, what were you going to say, actually? I was going to say, I think part of the reason why the last bit was so draggy was he tried, it was Robert E. Howard tried to go into the sciencey shit. He tried to channel science and kind of failed, what, in my opinion. What, what, you, what, you, what are you talking about in specific? He went into a lot of detail about how the mirrors work. Didn't he? Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, that's he did for sure. Yeah. And you feel like that didn't work. Um, hmm, it's a bit hard to say. Well, the thing is, so there are two two parts that stood out to me where he really went into detail. One is the ancestry of uh, Tuck. Was it Tuck or Thar? Tuck. I, I call him Thak. But Thak. Anyway. Thak. Well, the ancestry of Thak, he was trying to mm. obviously channel evolution and doing it badly. Uh, and then there's the bit of uh, prismatic engineering with the mirrors and stuff. And then a little bit of you get a sense. And then when he describes like the traps, you get a sense that Nabonidus is less of a, a magician than he is an engineer. Hmm. So he 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 went into he went into some detail about how the how how the traps in the house work and if he had left out all of that, then I think uh, probably the 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 last bit would have been um, would have flowed a little bit faster I guess and uh, he in my opinion he would have been better mm-hmm. off not going into detail in all those. All those things, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I I agree, but uh, it's still a, it's still a good story, and uh, it makes you think about the socio political situation in in Hyboria. I think one could define the the setup by an, inventing the term Conanism, which is to say. The kind of society, uh, kind of social um, philosophy that leads to Conan stories, um, in, like you, you got to have lots of uh, corrupt um, aristocrats and and wizards and and kings and so on, and uh, the whole thing is just tailor made for a barbarian to to have adventures in. And that's uh, that certainly is a good uh, way of looking at the the first part of the story, where Murillo yeah. is is quite a character in his own right, um, and he he's a bit of a rotter as well. But he's not he's not a weakling. He uh, he has some good points, some good points to him. Mm. And as for this end bit about throwing a stool. Um, as I've got a quote here in my uh, edition, in the yeah. introduction, there's a quotation from the author who says, uh, <laughs> apparently Howard explained his preference for heroes of massive muscles and simple minds. He says, they're simpler. You get them in a jam and no one, el- no one expects you to rack your brains inventing clever ways for them to extricate themselves. They are too stupid to, any- to do anything but cut, shoot, or slug themselves into the clear. Uh, so that's, that takes away a lot of the stress in plotting your stories. I, I absolutely oh, yeah. agree, because it's very hard to write a clever character. Very hard. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, you, you yes. have to be clever yourself. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's why. Oh man. Yeah, you can't. Actually, we're, gonna, we're gonna cut the cut the layers out of the book. <laughs> it's <laughs> I'm, it's, I'm not smart enough. it's it's how how do I say this? It's very hard to write a clever character cleverer than the author himself. It's very mm-hmm. very hard. So, uh, G. R. R. Martin uh, did a great job with Tyrion and. That means that G.R.R. Martin is as cunning, ruthless as Tyrion himself. Mm. I uh, I damned G.R.R. Martin with a faint praise there. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is very hard to write a, a, a clever, um, genius 
character because it's uh, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. I think the nearest Conan comes to being clever is that he uh, he does have, at least in the latest stories, he, he develops some insight into character. That is to say, it becomes more and more difficult to fool him. Uh, I remember there's a story called Jewels of Guai Lua, quite a good story, where unlike in the first uh, unlike in sorry, unlike in this story where a woman succeeds in temporarily um, making a chump out of him, in Jewels of Guai Lua, the, the same sort of thing is tried and, and he sees through it straight away. I mean, um, even even not so clever guys eventually learn uh Learn to be not so naive, you know. Speak for yourself. Okay. <laughs> sure, Nikki. Uh, I speak for myself here. <laughs> Ladies, if you want to make a fool of me, you got it. Um, so, um, one other aspect of Rogues in the House that I really like um, is the fact that, uh, you know, Conan is not betrayed by the person who hired him. The, the like the most massive of all um, shockers of this story, you know, the fact that he actually gets to um, have a good uh, rapport with somebody, you know, and it makes it possible that perhaps in the future we could see him work with this guy again. You know, it's so mm. cool. The fact that we we have something like that occur that doesn't occur mm. that 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 um, that much. No, it's a uh, contrast it, with the golden bowl where he's hired by someone who then betrays him. Uh, yeah, basically every story. Uh, the god in the bowl, you mean? Gold, Not the sorry, golden. the god in the bowl. The golden bowl was by Henry James, who's a slightly different author. Yeah. <laughs> slightly. Just slightly. Just slightly. <laughs> I, like, I like the slightly different comment. Uh, yeah, so to me, to me, it's just, you know, it's, it's good to see. Um, you know, change in in, uh, or at least uh, the fact that the the stories are not repeating themselves I, too much. Uh, uh, I think like bringing up, I was actually thinking of the God in the Bow as well because uh, there is one other similarity in in this story, and that is the the story actually starts with another character, and mm. it, it stayed with the other character for quite quite a long time and Conan is almost like a secondary character in mm. this uh, particular story he's I really can't call him the protagonist here but he is uh, more prominent than in most other stories like for example if you look at you, you can call him basically a side character in Beyond the Black River because we see him a bunch and he does a bunch of stuff but most of the time until the uh, the actual ending where he gets to fight the the big bad creature, right? That that devil, he's not really there, uh, mm. doing not that much, right? Mm. So I mean, I do agree with you there. I mean, uh, I I I think I think this is a very interesting way of uh, of uh, expanding like an ongoing uh, universe. Where where yeah. you put your focus on other characters instead, and the main character just kind of becomes like a side uh, side guy in that particular story. It's it's very nice to be able to if I think it works because Conan is a serialized story, and um, uh, uh, like some some episodes you changing the perspective to other denizens of uh, the Hyborian age would have been would is is refreshing I think mm, mm. Yeah, A Witch Shall Be Born is another story where Conan actually doesn't appear at all until part two and I suppose the parts kind of alternate non-Conan Conan non-Conan Conan yeah, I mean at some point mm. at, at some point you gotta you gotta be able to flesh out uh the the universe that uh, the world I I think is a neat way to world build. Mm. Yeah. Sure, I agree on that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was one story that Howard didn't finish, which actually 
did not have Conan in at all, although he's mentioned. But uh, I think it, it was one of those he didn't finish, and it had to be finished by De Camp or Lynn Carter or something. Um, so I didn't bother to read it. Cause... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, some of them are not that bad. Like for example, the City of Skulls. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not the best story of all time. I'll give you that. But it it's adequate. Yeah, yeah, it's adequate. Well, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think I share the same sentiments that Rob has. Like, if the story had to be finished by another author, I tend to stay away from it. Um, mm. I didn't. I didn't pick up and read the last two books of uh, the Wheel of Time myself because um, the original author died before he could finish it and. I was like, because like you like you, you know you basically know like the um, the tone and the style, uh, the diction, the diction of the story would change immensely uh, mm. from author to author. And when I finally picked up the last two books of the Wheel of Time, it's it's uh, unrecognizable to me as. Mm. Uh, as a wheel of time story so yeah i basically had to read it as a new story mm. it's bad enough when an author comes back to his own series after a long long gap of time like with isaac as i'm of the original foundation series oh. was great but then about 20 years later he he's he went back to it and started continuing it and the, the result is lamentable the second foundation was pretty boring, I gotta admit. Oh, I, I didn't think so. But anyway, the, my main point... It sounded is, so sad, actually, Robert. <laughs> that it's not boring? <laughs> I think... Uh, I think... Uh, the second foundation, uh, Isaac Asimov uh, started to focus more on um, the philosophy behind the story instead of telling a good story. So, mm. I mean, there are some things that stuck with me uh, from the second foundation, but uh, yeah, the first one, the first set was definitely more. In- no, so I think, I think, uh, hang on, we're getting confused here. I know we're not supposed to be talking about those books, but that's all right. There's, the first series comprises foundation, foundation and empire and second foundation. But I think when you say second foundation, you mean the second lot of books. Yes, correct. Started twenty correct. years later. Correct. And correct. Th- that that's Foundation's Edge and yes. the other two, yes. Foundation and Earth and Forward the Foundation. Yeah. But completely uh, correct. Yeah, and th- yeah, I quite agree with you there. And and also he he tries to tie it in with his um, his robot stories, and that's a complete yeah. failure. Complete yeah. failure. Yeah. Mm. Trying to make a mystery of uh, Earth's origins and all that, and yeah, it just didn't work. Mm. Yeah. Pity, it's a great pity. Anyway, back to Conan. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, that's one of the <laughs> tangents that just rolled <laughs> off. Is yeah, it's from Conan to Isaac Asimov. Mm-hmm. It's not a bad uh, tangent to to get on. I wish I had more contribute i simply can't i never read any of those stories never read foundation Foundation. well you're you're only a young man nikki i mean you're you're barely out of the cradle you know that's true your life uh, my mother keeps telling me that that as well uh... well yeah um i don't know uh isaac asimov is one of those things that uh i think not is not everybody's cup of tea Mm. yeah yeah he doesn't know he didn't understand his own strengths as an author uh and that's probably true lot, lots and lots of authors they don't realize that they're like prospectors for oil you know you dig in the ground and suddenly whoosh comes a load of goodies uh and you don't know wh- really where they've come from and what you ought to do is to stay near that particular well and and exploit it. But mm-hmm. they, they go off and they think they can do other things and they can't. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Isaac Asimov regards himself first as a scientist, then as a writer, 
and his writings very much reflect that. But anyway, yeah, let's get back to <laughs> Conan. Mm. <laughs> I think uh, I think uh, to to jump off uh, the point that you just raised, uh, Robert, is that uh, I think the the two big flaws in this in this story for me is is uh, well one I've already brought up not all the bad guys come from the east and uh, the other one is i i really think uh robert e howard should have stayed away from signs it's just not his own strategy. he's pretty good at uh he's pretty good at humor i the, i laughed uh, the, once the, or twice. well i mean the humor is mm-hmm. obviously there it's very comic uh very comic in the popeye sense uh uh, Popeye and Mickey Mouse sense. It's very theatrical. It's very physical. Um, but yeah, like the science bit that he tried to channel, he's just not good at it. And he should just he should have just stayed away. I don't know. Mm. I think science is is quite. You don't have to be good at it. It it's a kind of prop, you know, like uh, uh, well, like some some stories use religion as a kind of prop it's really i think no, i no think i i phrased yeah. myself badly um mm. he he when he tried to explain the how the mirrors work it was one chunk of text when he tried to explain the ancestry of fuck it was also a chunk of text and i mm. think that is that is what I am pointing out. Like he's he's not really weaving it into a story like he no. usually does with his sorceries and stuff like that. So it yeah. reads like a law dump, uh, which mm-hmm. is kind of boring. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the only that's uh, my only issue with the story. Two probably issues. common in pulp fiction of the time mm-hmm. in nineteen thirties fiction. You got lots of these dumps of text. Science. Yeah, it's like, it's like the villain. Uh, what what's what's that line? The villain is always undone in the exposition because he, <laughs> the villain always uh, explains his uh, dastardly uh, plans, and then uh, yeah, you know, it has that feel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, you get that in James Bond an awful lot. Um, Bond would never get anywhere if if. If the villains weren't so stupid as to capture him and boast instead of just killing him out of hand, which they could easily do. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I don't have anything more to say about the story. Uh, it's very entertaining. Uh, mm. It is. It is one of those things that is very readable, uh, not outstanding, but it's it's a pleasant way to pass time. That is my take Hmm. yeah Hmm. I would say that um, this is probably one of the more entertaining tales by Robert E. Howard for me personally Um, Mm. the reason being that it is uh, it tries to be so different Uh, because all of his other uh, stories by um, you know about Conan they're they don't match the same energy as this one and the casual way that everything happens in the tale it really does capture that essence uh for me and it makes it uh my, way more enjoyable because mm-hmm. of that if it wasn't uh as casual and as laid back um i think the coolness of the situation the f- the atmosphere uh, would not be as uh, interesting and as enjoyable as it was for me. Um, I would even say that um, the 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 type of casual uh, effectiveness that happens uh, with, within the story uh, really showcases to me um, that this is the type of uh, tale that can really get someone immersed. Right, if they're in the right mood, in the mood to to be entertained by such a situation, uh, to be um, as you said, you know, like sitting there and enjoying a nice um, set of refresh uh, refresher ref- refreshments uh, as well as snacks, right? 
this this is the tale to read. Um, yeah, and, and because of that, I really uh, respect it and very much enjoy it. Mm. So you'd rate it highly uh, among the other Conan stories? I would say that just for the atmosphere itself, this is a 9 out of 10 story for me. Mm. Just because of the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, if if I were a little bit more scrutinous, um, you know, if I if I applied a little bit more scrutiny towards the the tale itself, um, I would give it a, a, a solid eight out of ten. Hmm. Hmm. What about you, Robert? What do you give this story? Um, I think because of the the flaw I mentioned, because there's a bit too much in the underground bit i'd probably uh rate it among the the, the lower kind of 50 percent of conan tales but that's pretty that's still pretty good uh, so it, it depends what you mean really i'd i'd maybe rate it uh, i'd give it a, a solid seven i think but these these figures are a bit difficult to arrive at. Uh, it's not an exact mm. science, this, is it? That's true. Okay. Well, actually, you didn't really give a, a number. Do you have one in mind? Uh, sure. Uh, entertaining and pleasant read out of you know, uh, too much time on your hands. Sounds like a six and a five. <laughs> uh, yeah, six and a half out of ten. Mm. Uh, the number I was thinking is more like 7.5 or something like that. Actually. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's mm. usually how I rate things that I will find enjoyable, but may or may not pick up depending on how much time I have. Mm. Mm. Yeah, anything below 7 is uh, kind of like, mm, maybe not, uh, mm. but maybe yes. Uh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Interesting. All right. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I think I, I think guess we have, I uh, guess we have wrung dry the any everything we can say about this uh, short story. I will say one more thing. Uh, the the monster uh, Thak is is very entertaining. Uh, we we see him be quite um, quite cunning and assertive in his own way, and that is enjoyable to see for mm. a very minor vi winner. Well, I uh, would. Villain. I would. I would note that uh, Conan gave his respect to Thak, uh, Thak in the end, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so Nabonidus uh, looked looked upon Thak uh, as uh, as nothing more than a kind of smart uh, beast, but uh, Conan treated Thak as a as a man, I think. Even went as far as to say I will have my women sing of him or something like that. Yeah, as as Conan. That, yeah, that's the only that, way he well, sees this. Yeah, you know, respect for your enemies is uh is a pretty uh Conan thing to hmm. respect for a worthy enemy is a pretty Conan trait. Yeah, mm, that 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 is for sure. All right, well, uh, I guess Robert, do you have any last words? No, no, I don't. Uh, not no last words. No, no. I've still got things to say, you know, in the last part of my life, but I won't say them just yet. Oh, okay. Jesus! <laughs> That's a bit more of it, don't you think? Well, is it? It is a rainy uh, Sunday morning for me, so I guess the mood <laughs> checks out. Okay. Well, um, thank you uh -huh. for your attention, listeners, and uh, have a nice week ahead. And if you like uh, the, sh the podcast, give a like and subscribe. Thank you. And good day. Thank you very much for uh, joining us.